Hi. Thank you for your patience, although I see a whole social hour has emerged, so that's good. It's always good. I'm Victoria Vesna. I'm a professor in the Department of Design Media Arts that's hosting Natalie Jomijenko. And I'm also director of the Art Science Center that hosts the Arts and Activism Lecture Series, so we're co-hosting, which is quite appropriate because Natalie is an artist scientist and an artist activist and a designer and a media artist and we love that and we're absolutely thrilled to have her back. Uh, I like that background music and that was kind of nice. <laughs> Why did it stop? Anyway, um, so Natalie now currently is an associate professor at NYU in the visual department and I heard from some sources she's got a pretty cool group and they're buzzing away, working away. Um, she's got, uh, her, her background is just a fantastic an engineer who has also studies in biochemistry, physics, neuroscience, and precision engineering. Uh, however, she's using all of this to do really important artwork in the social sphere as an artist and activist, which you will see in a minute. Uh, her work has been shown at Mass MoCA. She was uh, a couple of years ago at the Whitney Biennial, and she was a Rockefeller Fellow. Recently, she was named one of the 40 top innovative artists, scientists, fellows, I'm not sure what, influential designers, sorry, um, by the ID magazine, and top 100 young innovators by MIT, I confused the two. Uh, she's also director of the Design and Environmental Health Clinic, as you see here in this X, and um, has a wonderful, great history that I'm not going go, to go into because we already ate some of our time. And I just want you to give Natalie a very warm welcome. Thank you. It's really a great pleasure to be back here in these fancy digs. I'm very impressed. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll ask you actually to pull out your cell phones because I'll want you to use them, but if you can turn off the sound, that would be good. And I'm going to blame my lateness on um, the really fantastic student work that I was seeing this afternoon. I was just blown away, and um, I'm sorry I didn't come um, for my tech chat um, and uh, tech chat. Ch check, I <laughs> can't even say it. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, what I thought I'd do today is uh, talk about my new lab and clinic at NYU. Uh, which is the environmental health clinic. And just let me play this to you. I have to, okay, so, uh, let me do that again. It's a, um, the environmental health clinic, a twist on health, right? One more time, just, <laughs> which is um, really to reframe what constitutes health. And I know it's odd to be talking uh, as a new media artist to a digital design department about health, but I think it's precisely because digital media artists have long been involved with a stake in the information commons that you will recognize the environmental commons that's embodied by understanding health or environmental health. So um, what I'd like to um, just quickly go through this and, and talk, uh, introduce you to some of the kind of concrete issues around why and how we can reimagine our relationship to natural systems given there's a climate crisis given there's a food crisis, given that the demand to kind of restructure and rethink how we relate to natural systems is urgent. Um, so I set up my lab at NYU as the Environmental Health Clinic, and it really follows the model, the familiar script of uh, a, a health clinic, using the familiarity um, precisely because it addresses um, uh, address, addresses, you don't have to be an environmental activist um, or a new media artist to understand how to make an appointment at a, at a clinic, right? You, you, it's pretty familiar and straightforward. Um, but the issue is with this health clinic, people who um, come to the health clinic are called, the environmental health clinic are called impatients as opposed to patients because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change to address local environmental health issues. Um, so these impatients come and make an appointment uh, they, um, they actually sign a, a, you know, a, a release form 
Um, and actually, with a handy-dandy quote from Hippocrates of the same Hi Hippocratic Oath, who himself says, the greater part of the soul lays outside the body, treatment of the inner requires treatment of the outer. So this is um, this kind of reframing of what counts as health, away from a kind of medicalized, individual, internal, atomized view of health, to something that's external and shared and we can act on, right? Um, and this is, a, again, a response to the ways in which we've, the globalized discourse that has um, embodied environmental uh, concerns, global, you know, we talk about global climate crisis. We don't talk about, you know, a, a devastating hurricane in um, Louisiana. We talk about global biodiversity loss. We don't talk about three, the ex extirpation of three species of birds from your local park, right? The unfortunate consequence of the good work of 30 years of environmentalism, where really environmental issues have had to be rendered global enough to be newsworthy, has this terrible consequence that they're not local enough to be actionable. By definition, we can do nothing about global climate crisis, global biodiversity loss, right? So the environmental health clinic is really about restructuring the participation to act on local environmental health, where we do have agency, where we can act. Um, and so people come um, and they formulate their, following this script of the, um, the clinic, they formulate, you know, you formulate your own concerns, your own environmental health concerns. Um, and you walk out not with prescriptions for pharmaceuticals, but with prescriptions for what I call lifestyle experiments or design interventions, things that you can do, prescription products um, that improve local environmental health. Um, again, reframing what counts as health. And just one, one other little motivation for this view of health, uh, which of course is... You can be pro-development or anti-development. You can be, uh, no one's anti-health, right? It's a, uh, it's a shared value and, and it's environmental commons. Now to illustrate that, I would ask you to, um, uh, to answer this question that, from a recent study by Philip Landrigan where he polled um, all the pediatricians in New York City um, for what they actually did in their office hours when they're seeing patients. So, you know, these are traditional pediatricians, medically trained, trained to deal with diseases and germs and viruses and things. And um, the, the top five things that they spend 80 to 90 percent of their hours, their office hours on meeting with patients are, number one, can you guess? Sorry? No, no. This is actually, actually with patients. It's actually asthma is the thing they spend the most, uh, the most time on. Number two is developmental delays. Number three, 400-fold increase in rare childhood cancers. Number four and five are obesity and childhood diabetes and related uh, issues. So that obviously all of those top five things radically implicate the environment. Medicos are not trained in, uh, in dealing with this. And, and for one other example, of lead le levels which are monitored in, in children um, uh, by federal uh, legislation. Um, if you find lead, high lead levels in kids as a pediatrician, what do you do? <laughs> you tell the, pa the parents, don't let your kids eat paint chips, lead paint chips, right? I don't know any parents who feed their kids lead paint chips, right? But, uh, but actually understanding that you might have a population that has an unusually high, or that there might be a contaminated park, or where the children are being exposed is not, it's totally outside of the medical paradigm, right? So, so this, pushing this idea that health is actually external and the environment is radically implicated um, is why I'm framing things in, in this way. Um, actually, this is the study. Um, and some of the um, nomicas. So part of this is, uh, is actually, um, of course, having holding clinic hours and office hours where we actually co-produce um, and explore the concerns that are formulated. Um, and uh, we do this in a number of places. This is actually the field office in the East River. I'll show you a little bit of video um, here.
from here. Um, so this was uh, in the field office we had um, in, the, in, uh, in the East River. Uh, we can go, go back to it. It turned out, I, just, I don't want to show you the, the, yeah, the guy on there. It turns out that um, this, this is actually a women's environmental health clinic. Where is this? Oh, sorry. I'm trying to show you a little bit of video. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, it, guys way too much, <laughs> so they kept crumbling this. So this, is, this was for women only, this, uh, em, environmental, uh, this particular environmental health clinic. Um, uh, this was actually a, a recent um, environmental health clinic hours held in um, Ghent, um, where we actually had uh, held office hours in the middle of the roundabout in the center of the city. Again, you start to see that we're reclaiming um, urban spaces and reimagining. But yeah, particularly using the, um, the iconography of the roundabout for its headless social movement, as opposed to the traditional um, intersection, red light intersection, where you have a top-down authority telling you to suspend your judgment. And you know, if you judge your own body is at, at, uh, and your own, uh, is, is at risk here, but if you decide it's safe to go through a red light, you'll still get a fine, right? You, you actually have to suspend your judgment. Whereas in a, in a, in a roundabout, you have the, the construct where it's people, making, people in situ making their own decisions that coordinate into an effective um, device. Um, so that was a, um, a useful place to meet. So let me t show you some of the pr uh, prescriptions and protocols that many people are concerned for water quality. Um, and so there's a theme of, of using um, inexpensive, ubiquitous biosensing devices. Um, in this case, inpatients concerned for um, contaminants in their water would be prescribed uh, a uh, tadpole bureaucrat. So what these are, uh, tadpoles, um, Rana castabians, the native, Cali uh, the native um, uh, amphibian bullfrog, the Amer American bullfrog, um, each of which is named after a local bureaucrat whose decisions affect water quality, right? Um, and so the, uh, the impatient raises these tadpoles, keeping tabs on their water samples, because precisely because these organisms are exquisitely sensitive biosensors for the whole class of industrial contaminants we call endocrine disruptors, right? Um, and through their behavioral toxicology, I mean, they, essentially, they may not look that much like us, although the resemblance to some of the bureaucrats is startling. Um, <laughs> They are biologically similar, particularly in their uh, T3-mediated um, uh, developmental processes. So they're adolescents where they actually dissolve organs and grow new limbs um, is even more traumatic than our own. Um, and we have these kind of very companion animal devices that allow you to kind of closely observe your um, tadpole, um, have it with you as you're emailing. Um, and to, actually this is the tadpole walker, to take your tadpole for a walk in the evenings, um, <clears throat> getting it out. And what happens here is, of course, the dynamic that um, we're interested. If you take your tadpole, and I can testify to this, um, for a walk, people will ask you, what the hell are you doing, <laughs> right? And you'll have to explain, um, you know, introduce them to your tadpole, introduce them to the, you know, people will then have to know the, the, uh, the name of their local EPA or DEC, or uh, uh, you know, bureaucrat, um, explain your concerns about the water, the water quality, and pretty soon you have um, all of your neighbors interested in, how's your tadpole going? <laughs> what's, what's going on with that? So at the end of this protocol where we um, successfully raise the tadpole, we take it to introduce it to its, its namesake and discuss the kinds of evidence that we've, um, that we've developed or learnt in, um, in doing this. And of course, this is the, um, the endocrine disruptors are uh, those things that are implicated in the breast cancer epidemic, the obesity epidemic, the um, two-year drop in the average age of menarche, onset of menarche, the first period in young girls, the uh, one full year drop in the um, average age of onset of breasts, which um, in the last eight years, um, and other very material, very biological consequences of post-industrial society. This is another biomonitoring um, 
uh, process, which involves, instead of being asked for a urine sample, I'll ask you for a mouse sample. Um, so uh, if you're lucky enough to have a mouse in your house, does anybody here have a mouse in their house? Anyone live with a mouse? You can admit it. It's, it's something to be proud of, actually. You're very fortunate. I don't believe you. <laughs> anybody here on antidepressants? Oh, look at that. <laughs> I don't believe you either. <laughs> anyway, um, as it turns out, the um, uh, mice, uh, mice and rats, as you know, 95% of all pharmaceuticals are tested only on mice and rats before they're administered to, um, to humans. They're the gold standard of animal models, and they model us biologically, consequentially, all the time. However, they're also very good, and I would argue even better, environmental health models in so much as that not only the same body mass, convenience, short lifespan, so the exposure rates are, are better, um, uh, so more, um, more visible effects, more observable effects, but they share your environment. They share all your environmental stressors, right? Your asbestos levels, your lead levels, you know, what, what you live with, they live with. They also share your diet, largely, right? Um, and and so uh, what's involved in this protocol is really, um, well, the first step is, of course, building the better mousetrap, right? So this is one of the mousetraps that we built with um, uh, a curator um, who um, is on antidepressants um, and uh, able to admit it. <laughs> and he, um, so we were interested in, you know, does he have the same kind of responses to these environmental stressors? Will he self-administer? Will your... your well, his mouse self-administer antidepressants in the same way the curator does. And so on here, on the first thing you'll see are the spoons. That's actually Zoloft. Um, the next one is Prozac. The next one is um, a black jelly bean. And the next one is a uh, muscle relaxant. These are things out of his me medicine cabinet. Um, he also liked a drink or two. So we wanted to see if the, the mice actually also coped with their environmental stress or similarly. So, um, that's vodka in solution, gin in solution, plain water, and the muscle relaxant in solution, right? Any guesses on um, whether or not they self-administered antidepressants, SSRIs? Are they? Uh, they did. <laughs> they did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A very strong preference for Zoloft over Prozac. Uh, not that you'd be interested in that, but, you know, but, oh, uh, yes. They, yes, exactly. That's right, sponsorship from Zola. Um, they also, they did like the, the, um, the muscle relaxant, but they didn't like the black jelly bean, which I understand entirely. Um, vodka, gin, what do you think? Of course. They love the vodka. They drank as much vodka as plain water. They didn't touch the gin, and um, they weren't so hot on the muscle relaxant and solution. But so once, once we've done these kind of experiments, of course, they're eventually captured in this um, container where there's the old cell phone, um, uh, and um, when the mouse goes in, it actually dials the clinic. We come zooming out, pick up the mouse, and we actually take the blood samples and the hair samples from the, the mice and put them through to do the blood work to look at the, um, the levels there. So we're currently doing a, um, a set of um, building better mouse traps around Greenpoint to look at benzene emissions. Um, everybody I know in this room knows somebody who lives in Greenpoint. Um, and <laughs> so uh, look out for, you know, if you have any design ideas for mouse traps, which of course mouse traps embody the whole history of human animal uh, arms race. Um, uh, but, okay, so this is another um, uh, protocol. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this is actually the biomonitoring device we use here as humans. Um, and this brings on the, I think, one of the representational crises we face. Um, the Clean Air Act you would be familiar with, um, and you might also have heard of the Clear Skies Initiative. So the Clear Skies Initiative was the Bush administration's uh, initiative to dismantle the Clean Air Act, right? Um, <clears throat> clear skies, right? That sounds good, right? Who would know that that would mean 17-fold uh, increase in mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants? Who would guess that clear, the Clear Skies Initiative means more pollution? 
right? Orwell called that doublespeak, right? We are in, and this is this is this is the kind of representational crisis that I I want to point to, where words are failing, right? Words no longer mean what they say, right? So this using the mask, which is um, the clear skies question mark mask. Um, this is a standard N95 particulate matter mask, the sort that people, uh, there was uh, three people wearing them on the airplane on the way over here, um, actually. Um, but they, of course, signify a social emergency. Um, but in this case, we've adapted it to um, a screen print on a gray scale, a photographer's gray scale, um, and, of course, the question in clear skies. The photographer's gray scale means that as you wear it around the grime that accumulates on the, the um, mask that would otherwise lodge in your pretty pink lungs, you can read off against the grayscale. So you get a stochastically robust measure of the rate of accumulation of that diesel fume, that elemental carbon that's so, um, irrita uh, ir that's so irritable to, um, to our respiratory tracts. Um, so you have your own direct material measure of air quality, and you, it's it's you know, it's also a micro propaganda event. Actually, uh, the couple of editions that I've done on these, um, people uh, are invited to annotate them. My favourite one is still just simply said bush smells, which <laughs> we can say that now, right? <laughs> In a post bush um, context. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm Okay, uh, I'm going to skip through a few things. This is a, um, a prescription product, the first prescription product that we um, have done in the Environmental Health Clinic. And iconically, um, a very simple and perhaps um, uh, too simple of a um, uh, thing, but really trying to get at a systems issue. So we're actually doing a small manufacturing one of these uh, systems now, which are called the green light system. And what it is is a light fixture. It's a light fixture that couples plant growth to, uh, to lighting um, simply by creating a light fixture that houses a uh, high efficiency LED um, which is spectrally tuned so that it not only uh, provides a, a nice white light um, but also in this the part of the spectrum where chlorophyll absorbs so it supports plant growth, right? Um, so sharing the lighting resource with, and why are we doing this? Because of course uh, the very best nanotechnology we have at absorbing um, formaldehyde, benzene, toluene, the common indoor air pollutants, which as we build our buildings to be, perform better environmentally, our indoor air is getting worse, right? Um, platinum leads buildings have um, notoriously bad air quality. You seal the buildings better, you insulate them better, and so the buildup of these common uh, pollutants gets worse. Um, and so what plants do um, is uh, phytoremediate and absorb and fix and break down not only the plants but the soil microbes, um, these common indoor air pollutants. So what, I, what I'm showing here is um, an alternative to the traditional way that we deal with environmental issues. And systemically, we displace our environmental issues, right? We, we have a toxic sludge in the Hudson River. We spend 30 years, legislative and legal strategies, to get GE to agree to uh, dredge that toxic sludge and sh ship it off to the nearest third world country or to Pennsylvania, where it continues to be toxic sludge, right? Um, and... <clears throat> Or we have HVAC systems or air conditioning systems where we take indoor air um, and we flush, you know, push it out there and we flush indoor air with outdoor air, which of course is based on the presumption that outdoor air is cleaner than indoor air, right? Which is a presumption that doesn't hold in most cases, most days in urban centers. So we're spending all this energy flushing indoor air with outdoor air, um, displacing our problems without actually dealing with them without treating them. And so this system is a closed and coupled system design that's actually not only um, coupling the light to the plant growth in this very simple and direct way, but it's also driven, it's powered by a solar awning. And the solar awning is what I've been spending a, a bit of time 
doing, um, and we have this system going, it's a little schematic here. Um, it's, uh, the difference between a solar awning and, and of, of course, if you can afford or have $40,000 to put solar uh, on your roof, good on you, I'm glad you do. Um, but uh, this is a, a case where, of course, it's an awning, it's an old technology. We know that it reduces heat gain, reduces your air conditioning bills by about 25% um, to a half um, just by shading the window. And then, um, of course, creating um, an opportunity to project inside. So what we got working with these solar awnings, again, actually, just let me point out something, that to put up a solar awning as opposed to um, you know, coating your rooftops with solar is a, something you can do yourself. It's a small scale, it's concrete. The engineers that I work with, um, my students, good energy systems people who, uh, who really don't know whether they can charge two laptops, their phone, and three lights with a five by five sol solar panel, right? How many of us are really intuitive about that, right? We really don't even know how to use these locally generated power systems. We haven't got robust understandings of them, but this is a concrete system that again is not only comprehensible in its scale, but it's also visible. So people, if you put up a solar awning, are gonna ask you, what's that, right? And then you'll have to explain, and of course the social propagation of ideas of these lifestyle experiments changes. So but what we got working is this projection system um, that, in fact, this is the uh, one of the prototypes. Just let me show you. Um, I think we have it here. Um, so that as the sun moves over the um, the awning, it does this very slow animation, um, an in internal dialogue, projecting images inside uh, your domestic space. Um, so this is a um, uh, a time lapse of the different projection system that is being illuminated by the sun shining through your solar awning, where we remove less than 10%, but we have a, a now a very slow new media, if you will. <laughs> um, So I, we've given invitation for anyone. We're actually in production with these um, solar projection, solar awnings systems. So anybody interested in working in this media, um, we've we've got a system that um, works, and I would invite um, invite you. All prescription products have uh, a lot of fine print, and this is actually the fine print for this, uh, which is really the what I'm most interested in. What are the side effects of being able to build and implement your own closed and coupled system that locally treats indoor air concerns, right? What changes here? So this is, um, you know, at risk of uh, actually developing a robust understanding of how to use local off-grid power generation. What carbon neutral, carbon negative systems can look like. It's a familiarity and a robust understanding that I'm most interested in. Um, this is another prescription that we've been developing at the Environmental Health Clinic called the no-park prescription, which takes a no-parking space like those associated with uh, a fire hydrant and prescribes the removal of the, um, of, of the asphalt uh, where, um, to create a, an engineered micro-landscape that um, absorbs the roadborne pollution. And again, this is an issue that is radically different. It's a really important challenge to us right now because the biggest pollution burden, certainly in the New York, New Jersey harbor and in most urban centers, is no longer the GEs. It's no longer the big polluters. It's no longer the deep pockets. The biggest pollution burden on this in the New York area is the massive network of roads of imperfe impervious surfaces that gathers very efficiently, all that oily hydrocarbon waste, all those cadmium neurotoxicants, all the stuff from inside brake liners, all the gunk that goes onto the streets, and very efficiently, every single rain event delivers it straight to the aquatic ecosystem, right, where it's devastating. In this case, we're 
intercepting that and infiltrating that roadborne pollution into the rhizomic sphere with all that surface area that can grab all that, all those heavy metals, all that gunk in the soil, and uh, in some cases, phytoremediate uh, and fix and prevent it from from running into the to the aquatic ecosystem. Um, so here are some of the experiments we've done with it. Uh, uh, this is. Um, just a, a video that was set up that um, just took, I think, two seconds every five minutes um, and um, gives you a sense of... So the fire department, <laughs> we're working on them. <laughs> um, you know, the traditional way that I would have done this, and this maybe would, um, you know, in, in speaking to this audience, you know, the kind of interventionist impulse that we've had through the 90s of, of and the activist impulse is to, you know, to build this, implement something like this by having a street party, right, getting a permit, building a stage, putting on a very loud thrash band, cutting the concrete underneath, and then, you know, whoops, there's a no park, uh, let's, you know, after the street party, you know, that would have been the traditional way of doing it, right? Traditional activist way of doing it. But this, this shift now, uh, the institutional shift is kind of radically different. Certainly, um, I'm sick of my students being arrested, right? Our own colleagues, you know, Steve Kurtz was under bioterrorism uh, charges for five years, right? Uh, it's not fun to be arrested, right? Uh, so there's different strategies that I would argue are uh, important. Um, and uh, well, let me finish off with explaining these, and then we'll go back to that, and I hope uh, I'll return to it. There's, uh, there's different planning schemes. Um, this is the butterfly truck stop. There's 40 species of butterflies that are, um, inhabit or are seen in Manhattan, and in fact, uh, this is uh, all the plants that uh, habitat provisioning for those 40 species, so the truck stop for butterflies. Um, you can see that here that we've, what we've done is set this up and this is the methodology we use. We set it up um, within 15 minutes of setting this up, three species of butterflies appeared, right? It was as if they were waiting behind cars, <laughs> wait for a random piece of vegetation to appear, and they would descend on <laughs> coordinate. It was, uh, it was uh, um, phenomenal to see this urban biodiversity um, and the responsiveness of the system. But what we do is actually we set these, these these um, no parks up, and then we take images of them, and we issue these share prints, which are limited edition prints um, of what the no park would look like if we get this done. Right? We do a th maybe a thousand, or, uh, and we do if we sell them at like twenty dollars each, and we do a hundred of them. That's two thousand dollars. That's uh, in some cases the entire implementation cost. So the local block association, the inpatient, takes that to their block association, and. Um, and gives it as gifts or sells them to people. By doing that, by having these shares, these uh, share prints, um, we change who's paid for it, right, quite directly. But what we've, what we've done more directly is, is change the ownership structure. Who's going to pick up the Coke can that gets in? Because that's what the Department of Transportation is most concerned about. Um, you know, the street cleaners at all. What do the street cleaners do? Well, the street cleaners will go around it. <laughs> Big deal, right? <laughs> um, the fire department, of course, um, is very concerned about it, but it doesn't interfere with them. They can, you know, park there. So and I suppose this is the main point, is it really redefines what the emergency is, right? A fire truck can still park on a no park. They squash a few plants. Big deal. They'll gener regenerate, right? Um, but... The rest of the time, it's servicing the environmental health emergency, infil infiltrating roadborne pollution, and in fact, inserting leaf surface area. I think there's a picture here, leaf surface area into this. Um, this picture, I think, captures it into this thing called the stroller height phenomena, which is the boundary layer. A tragic name for um, the uh, the boundary layer of urban air. Um, that describes that the adult standing behind a stroller um, will, or the kid sitting in the stroller in front of the adult will experience about a thousand times worse air quality 
because that's where the tailpipes are. That's the heavy, unburnt hydrocarbons and swill around. And, you know, that's why dogs put their nose down to, to smell. And I invite you to kind of get down on your hands and knees in the street and smell the difference when you're, you're down there. But um, the stroller height effect, of course, is uh, mitigated as, as the environmental services that this vegetation provides. And outdoor air quality is, of course, um, intercepting airborne particulates, fixing CO2, um, improving air quality. There's no big news there, but um, you know we have a million tree project going on in Manhattan. Um, but that's all. All the environmental services that vegetation provides are leaf area index related. Um, how much leaf surface area there is. So the leaf area surgically inserted down in the stroller height um, boundary layer is approximately a thousand times more effective than the same leaf surface area um, on the trees. Um, my favorite no park um, is this one that I'm currently implementing in Iceland called the Climate Clock No Park, which takes, um, f which takes the blooming uh, plants, uh, blooming low growth vegetation in phenological order, right? Because when things bloom and the disturbances of blooming uh, is the most sensitive indicator of climate change. Um, so, and it has rippling effects in the urban ecosystem, right? Uh, because that's the kind of structure, the architecture of, of ecosystems. When things bloom, caterpillars are time to come out then, and the baby birds hatch then when the caterpillars are plentiful and when things bloom too early and that window is missed and there's no caterpillar, you know, the rippling effects are uh, extraordinary. So the, um, so the phenological effects is this, is this display of, of climate destabilization that we're witnessing. And the way you read this is actually with a fingernail tattoo, which has stripes, colored stripes on your fingernails that correspond to the colors of, uh, that are due to bloom. And of course, then as you're walking past, you can check your fingernails grow at about two millimeters a month, right? Um, and you calibrate uh, what's due to bloom against the, the no park as you're walking past, right? Um, reminding us that we are, of course, also biological organisms uh, subject to the environmental stressors and climate destabilizations. Our own fingernail growth is um, also um, evidence of, of that. Um, biological response. Um, okay, these are, that's the shares. Uh, the share prints actually um, you know, look like uh, limited edition prints on one side and shares on the other side. Um, let me come to this this issue, um, which I think best talks about the crisis of agency. That is the real and insidious, and I think scariest. Um, Tech set up and I didn't plug in. Huh? What did I do with me? Um, so, you, you, these are familiar to you. These are uh, climb, uh, fallout shelters, right? Does any? Uh, are they still? Uh, fallout shelters in, in LA. They're all over Manhattan. I was so shocked when I first got to uh, America and I saw these fallout shelters. And, you know, they were amazing, right? They, they appeared in a matter of months, right? They were put up by schools and churches and building associations and, uh, you know, they just appeared, individuals, you know, and they remain, they linger as an icon of civic mobilization in the face of shared uncertain threat. Somehow, driving at the speed limit, buying a local lettuce, changing the light bulb, just doesn't seem sufficient, right? And certainly doesn't instrumentalize the kind of uh, changes we are capable of, or it doesn't begin to look like civic mobilization. Um, so what would this climate, what would the fallout shelter for the climate crisis look like? Right. That's a question I've asked, and I think it looks something like this, <laughs> um, uh, or this. Um, these are early models of actually the urban space station, which um, I have almost 80% um, funded, 
uh, well, I have, eight, I have it almost funded, and it, I have 80% of the funds to build it. Um, and what it is is a, um, uh, is a, a greenhouse that lands on the roof, right? Because those of us interested in urban agriculture um, know that's a good idea. But the problem with roofs, this new territory that's opened up to us, is that you can't grow anything up there. <laughs> well, you can put about an inch of soil if it's a, on a code building, right? Um, or maybe an inch and a half um, with, if you put a lot of um, uh, styrene in it, maybe two inches. You can't grow a carrot in, <laughs> in two inches of soil because of the span loading limitations. Or, um, and do you want to grow your microgreens up there, right? Do you want that mercury that's in the air uh, on your lettuce, right? Maybe not. Um, so to make urban agriculture viable and um, when there's no soil, when uh, there's no uh, clean air, when there's no access to space, that space is expensive, requires a kind of a systems rethink. So the urban space station is an intensive urban agriculture facility that is on legs because it lands on the masonry walls and the columns where you've got effectively infinite loading capacity and no span loading whatsoever, right? It's a totally transparent uh, issue. So you can still have a green roof, but that is a green roof designed then optimized for biodiversity and habitat provisioning for all the insects and um, birds that provide environmental services in an urban, an urban ecosystem. Um, and then um, you've got a controlled space where you can do intensive urban agriculture inside of this greenhouse. But the main thing is that you're taking advantage of the local waste streams where the CO2 enriched air from the buildings is, you know, just like in a commercial greenhouse, where they actually run boilers to make CO2 to get the 40% increase in yield that you get in tomatoes and commercial uh, plants under when they grow them under elevated CO2 conditions. What we do is take the CO2 enriched air from the buildings from inside a room like this where um, we've got probably 100 and, you know, probably 200 and something ppm 250 ppm of CO2 enriched air here at the moment. That's why you're all being a bit sleepy, I think. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> um, anyway, the, the, um, the, the thing is we take this um, CO2 enriched air and we force it through the greenhouse and then we deliver oxygen enriched air back into the building so that we actually couple. And we do the same thing with gray, wa uh, gray water and, um, and actually other urban waste streams. Um, one of the best slow release nitrogen fertilizers is uh, human hair, right? No shortage of human hair in Manhattan, <laughs> right? Um, there's, uh, but it's not, it's not a viable fertilizer to use in a rural agriculture context, right? So it changes the game um, in, in uh, it's an open source hardware um, project. Um, and that investment in designing it so it it's, um, can be assembled by um, me and a bunch of students as a barn raising, if you will, a contemporary barn raising, is a, uh, an investment in the pedagogical value of hands-on, project-based learning, right? You know that if you've built something, you know how it works, you know how to maintain it, and you know how to improve it, right? You know how to build it better next time. So that's um, a commitment to the open source hardware. This was the... Um, the uh, quarter scale version we had in uh, Reina Sofia last summer, um, where it was working away, um, doing fun things. This is what it might look like if NYU, the evil real estate company that, uh, that uh, pretends it's an academic institution, um, <laughs> goes ahead, etc. Um, and actually, there's a, um, other parts of it. Um, that uh, uh, the solar chimney part, we've just implemented a few versions of that, um, which actually drives the air, just taking advantage of a, essentially a, a plastic um, thing. We've just implemented a few of these um, at a couple of sites around. Um, uh, these are just um, passive solar chimneys that take advantage of the thermal differential between the road, that boundary layer, the stroller height boundary layer. Um, and heats up, hot air rises, and it forces air through a solar chimney. Um, and that we change out the, um, the uh, filters that are forced through that collect all that grime 
and uh, we re-release that elemental carbon and we've been turning it into pencils, right? So then, I don't know, the pencil is mightier than the... As a measure of the, of the amount of grime that we can actually pull out. So this is a current project. This is actually... The photograph was taken three days ago by um, these guys. Um, over summer, I'm holding office hours in airspace, and I would invite you um, to come. Uh, so let me go into one final set of projects, um, which are related but has its own institutional context. Um, and you'll begin to see that each of the projects that I showed you um, and many of the others in the environmental health clinic um, by themselves have... Uh, um, What's, what's important to know is the kind of the aggregation of how it changes who can do something about local environmental health, right? How it figures out who has agency, right? Because that crisis of agency that I was talking about before is, is, is this uh, insidious and horrifying thing where, you know, what to do. And that's what we're all thinking about. I mean, no one's really done much, right, when we can't really do much. So this idea to kind of have an institution where it gives permission to develop and to explore and to do these lifestyle experiments, which I recognize in many people and authorizes them um, in the social networking site, celebrates them, recognizes them, and aggregates them, is actually where I think we can change where we can explore what works, what works for who, and how we can aggregate that. Um, so there's another kind of institutional tweak that um, you might know, um, a project that I've been working on for a number of years called the Ooze Project, um, which becomes very topical right now as we are forced to again understand zoonosis or our co, that our health depends on the health of chickens and pigs and swines, as they're called, um, and other animals with whom we share the environmental commons, right? So swine, as they said, the avian threatened avian th flu or this avian human swine flu epidemic that we're uh, living through at the moment is, of course, it's chickens and pigs, right? It's not... Uh, I know, walruses and, and kangaroos, right? These are factory farmed. These are, these are um, epidemics of our own making, as, as many people have now documented. So our health depends very much on the health of those non-humans we cohabit with. And I think it's really um, hard for us to understand that we are not alone. Right? that we uh, share our environmental space, our cities, with diverse non-human organisms. And how we can reimagine that, recognize that relationship, reimagine that relationship and change that relationship is what the Ooze Project is about, redesigning our interactions and our cohabitation with non-humans. Um, Ooze is, of course, zoo backwards and without cages, but is... Um, really a series of explorations um, to explore how things could be different. Right? Um, this is actually a, 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 from the kitchen um, a couple of weeks ago in, in Ghent where we, did, um, where we had 300 people eating like geese. This is um, selections from the cross-species cookbook, um, which... Uh, I'll show you. And this is actually, a, again, a reaction to in um, the very profound way in which we've, uh, the legacy or the, what we've inherited is this idea that, you know, do not feed the animals, right? Everywhere you, every New York City park has a sign, do not feed the animals, right? Um, also in every aquarium, there's a sign, do not tap on the glass, right? And there's usually kids tapping on that glass, right? <laughs> right there. So this idea, why can't you feed the animals? There are, there are reasons. So the received wisdom is, you know, well, in zoos, the case is, uh, is often, 
Don't feed the animals because, you know, human food is not good for them, right? It's good enough for humans, it's not good enough for, for <laughs> non-humans. In fact, in the case of the sparrow, um, the big sparrow decimation, the 80, 90 percent, you know, there's only a couple of breeding pairs of sparrows left in, um, in Hyde Park and London Tower. Um, the sparrow decimation in, uh, in New York and London the leading theory of that is um, the androgenic diet and the high LLD cholesterol. Um, so human food, you're right, is not good for, for non-humans, nor is it good for us. Same problems, right? <laughs> um, so uh, that's one of the reasons. But the other, I think, more prevalent re re reason is, um, you know, we'll interfere with them, right? You make them dependent on them. And you, you go to somewhere like Nas uh, Yellowstone National Park where you see more signs that say do not feed the animals than any animals you might feel threatened to feed, right? Um, why do we only think about interfering with the animals then? Why not on the way, as we drive along the freeway that cuts off their migration route that limits their nutritional resources? Yes, we're interfering with the animals. Right? We're changing the entire global climate. We're interfering with the animals. So the question is, could we, could we do those interferences, do those interactions need to be negative? Can they be um, actually constructive or generative? Um, the Cross Species Cookbook is a series of, um, um, of uh, meals that have been designed by now several really wonderful chefs and gourmet artists, including the, this is um, from the recipes that Deborah Solomon developed. Um, vegetable matter underfoot um, shows the process used in making this dish where the, in the kitchen the chef imitates the methods that geese use uh, pond side to mash down the vegetation that's producing a vegetable carpaccio. Um, and various other things. Um, it's, uh, that's the vegetable carpaccio. It was actually very delicious, um, I have to uh, say. Um, but this, this idea that, um, in fact, the, the, each of the chapters in the, in the Cross Species Cookbook um, with the goose dinner, you don't obviously eat the goose, you eat food that's delicious and nutritious to humans and non-humans, right, to geese and non-geese non or us. Um, and it turns out we eat the same stuff, right? We eat a lot of the same stuff, which reminds us that, of course, we're, we depend on the same resources. We live inside the same system. We're in this together. Um, so let me show you a couple of other interfaces for the, um, the, uh, the, the Ooze project. These are the, actually the ones that were in the, in the previous Whitney. Um, this is the interface for um, birds, communication technologies for birds. Um, what it, the way it works is when a, a bird lands on this, it triggers a sound file that instructs the humans into more cooperative behavior. Um, so it triggers a sound file, something like this. Now here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. Um, so there's actually, um, in this installation, as in every installation, there's a series of different arguments that the birds use uh, so that they can, in fact, experiment on people. Right, so the birds experiment on people to figure out which argument best elicits cooperative behavior. And there's arguments of, you know, uh, copyright dues for the melodic resources in cell phone ringtones. There's arguments for various sorts of things. But this is the one that the, um, the birds uh, in this installation triggered the most, um, that they decided was the most persuasive to, uh, for humans. Um, tick, this. tick. Tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well fed. Hence you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. Um, let me go through a couple of uh, these very quickly, and then I, I promise I'll finish off. Um, this is a, a, a actually going in the East River and the Bronx River 
Um, in summer, it's an interface for fish. Um, let me play that again. It's a series of buoys that um, has a, a fish detector um, ultrasound uh, 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 on it, and uh, it lights up when there are fish there, right? So a low-resolution display of fish presence, if you will, right? There are fish in urban bodies of water. There are fish in the East River. Um, and what it, it also sets up a feedback cycle. And the feedback cycle is, um, you know, when fish learn that when the lights go on, food is likely to appear, and people learn that when the lights go on, fish are likely to be there. And typically, people would feed stale white Wonder Bread to the fish. Um, I'm working in Reykjavik at the moment, a big show that opens. A major pollutant in the Reykjavik Torn, the pond in the middle of the city, is white bread. <laughs> right. Overwhelms the roadborne pollution. The, um, but so the, uh, and it's the case around the Washington uh, Mall, et cetera. Um, uh, so the, the, uh, the job is to change that interaction and um, the food, the fish fingers um, that is provided for people is actually uh, looks like uh, fishing lures, so it takes advantage of the visual communication strategies that have been perfected over many, many years of um, fishing lure technology. But the hook is that uh, there's no hook, right? Um, they, these... Uh, fish fingers, as they're called, are edible, are nutritionally appropriate so that as you feed the fish, it, it augments the population, right? It could augment the population. Moreover, um, there's a chitinol chelating agent in the um, fish fingers so that as the fish ingests the, the fish finger, it binds to the and just like a chelating agent, though it's the same chelating agent we use, uh, actually. Um, it binds to the bioaccumulated PCBs and heavy metals and allows them to pass it in a complex, less uh, reactive form where it settles into the silt and is effectively removed from bioavailability, right? So in those two examples, you get a sense that this whole idea of suicide environmentalism, which I call that because two students have independently come up to me and said, you know, if being a good environmentalist is about, you know, turning off the lights and using less gas and using less paper and, um, you know, reducing my carbon footprint and reducing, you know, wouldn't the best thing be to suicide, right, as the logical extension of an environmentalism approached through conservation and preservation where it's what you can't do and how much you can do less of and not what you can do and how to make that good, how to make it aggregate to a collective uh, action. So with this example, you can imagine that if many people feed the fish, the chelating agent, um, it might aggregate, aggregate to significant environmental remediation, which I would also contrast to, you know, we talked about dredging, the, the river, right? Um, think of the difference between an engineering firm coming in and, and dredging at once, taking it to Pennsylvania. Um, the political will that's required for the, I think the quote is uh, 16 million to, to do a small area. Um, and the tunability and the responsiveness that you can actually get with a dynamic socioecological system like the urban fish that live um, with us. I'm going to show you that. Um, uh, quickly, two more um, interfaces and then I'll finish. Um, this is uh, just to finish with some table manners. Um, uh, this is from a, a one of the um, elements in the uh, model urban development that was installed and is, is still installed, is permanently installed at uh, Postmaster's Roof in Chelsea, um, which was a model urban development both in scale and model, uh, uh, that is in, in the sense of scale, a model uh, is in the sense of ideal, looking at how we might reimagine, redesign our urban systems. Um, one of the elements in a scale, it was all scaled for the birds, um, and this is, an, uh, this is a feeding table for the birds that actually has, um, you know, that's one of the meals that was served. They like Rivita. I can't get my kids to eat them, but maybe the birds do. Um, by setting this food out on a table, we actually recognize the, uh, you know, the social relationships, right? Um, so we see who sits next to who. 
who thinks they're only worth eating the crumbs from underneath the table, who shares a plate. I mean, the, the, um, uh, and we can recognize this. But the other thing that's um, important about this piece is that there's a gun pointed at it, uh, and uh, actually a gun designed by Jenna from An Emanate. Um, uh, it's, which is um, not to say it's bullets, it's actually a high pressure water valve that when it's a little perch that's near the here, so when a, a bird lands on it, it shoots a uh, water at this table, knocking off any bird that's there, right? It doesn't kill them, it doesn't hurt them, it just knocks them off pretty violently. So will birds use technological advantage to monopolize nutritional resources, right? Will they use the gun to settle old scores to hog the food? Um, or will they use the Ferris wheel? This is the other millennium wheel. Urbanization, of course, produces leisure. Do the birds hang out on the Ferris wheel or do they sh shoot each other? Come on. I'm taking bets. Ferris wheel? You think pigeons are pacifists? Well, as it turns out, um, the pigeons spend a lot of time on the Ferris wheel. It took them about three days to work it out. And they spend uh, a lot of time going round and round and around and around and um, hanging out. They've triggered the gun twice. There's about 400 different pigeons that come, and that's it. They won't land there anymore. Somehow, you know, they've communicated to the whole community, even the ones that weren't there, not to land there. <laughs> so you're right, pigeons are pacifists. Um, I'll finish off by saying um, get out your cell phones um, because you're all about to become um, urban wildlife cartographers, um, wild, animal, um, uh, wild animal mappers. Um, the, um, the ooze has recently been formalized and we've launched the Bronx ooze, which is um, all of the Bronx except for um, the Bronx Zoo and the New York Botanic Gardens. Um, and uh, we've annexed the um, wildlife habitat of um, the island formerly known as Manhattan, um, which has now um, been renamed Decentral Park, um, where, of course, uh, to remind us that you know uh, nature doesn't exist inside little boxes like Yellowstone National Park or Central Park, but is in fact in this room, in the air quality, in the water quality, it's with us here. So this working uh, definition of natural systems has changed. What I'd like you to do is, um, is uh, put in to text to this number, 40404, uh, the words follow whose. So the, the, um, what that does is the next time you see a rat or a raccoon or a coyote or a jellyfish or an East River, you can text to this um, number, um, you know, something like this, Bats 8th Avenue and 28th Street. So that, you know, that exclamatory moment, I saw a rat, it was this big right there, um, you could actually now express to um, someone who's interested. Um, and what this allows us to do is real-time um, mapping of the fact that we share the environment with other non-human organisms and to um, launch wild animal safaris in Manhattan and the Bronx conveniently um, where we can in real time dynamically trace non-human routes and um, sightings of animals. Um, so let me finish with one of the most recent um, interfaces from the um, uh, Ooze project um, and this is actually to go deep into the underworld um, uh, and to challenge anybody here to take on the strongest animal in the world. Does anybody know who that is? Accept the challenge first and then I'll tell you. <laughs> Wrong. Some beetle, rhinoceros. Rhinoceros beetle, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you get you get to 
go first. Um, the strongest animal in the world, the hero of the underworld, is is the rhinoceros beetle. So kind of figuring out, and you know, there's soil biodiversity, which of course is this incredible asset that we've depleted and done terrible things to. These guys um, have this tremendous strength because they can and do, you know, I have to show you this. Um, you won't get a sense of their character un unless I um, show you. Oh. Oh, you know what, it, it is here. Sorry, I have it. I have it up. I'm sure I have it up. I just can't see it because we've got a funny little screen. No, okay. Well, anyway, let me tell you that there's a sport um, in rhinoceros beetle wrestling um, that looks like this. If you're in Indonesia, you can make um, any, uh, you can make a... Um, Uh, you can make a lot of money betting on, um, or you can lose a lot of money bet betting on rhinoceros beetle wrestling, um, which I actually have up. I'm sorry, I can't find it. I had it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's, this is a good one. This is, you have to see this. So this is what these guys do, and the reason why they can lift so much is because, of course, they, they can lift up logs, they aerate the soil, they provide um, for a great deal of, of aerobic um, soil enrichment um, because, they, um, because they have this kind of macho habit of kind of taking each other on um, that, of course, is exploited by... Um, macho guys. And it's one of the paradigms of, of um, environmentalism that I found really bothersome. Why is it that the kind of the, uh, the, you know, the, why is it the jocks have all the fun, right? Who, the hunters, the kind of, why is the masculinity, why, why are environmentalists emasculated, right? Why don't we get to have more fun, right? <laughs> um, it's this, uh, anyway, these kind of, these are kind of incredible icons of masculinity. Um, is what I'm trying to say. And if you want to actually interact with them, it, it requires kind of redesigning the interface. You know, I actually, before, I just stopped the money shot. I'm sorry, you missed it. One of them throws it off. I'm, I'm finishing. Um, so this is what a um, rhinoceros beetle wrestler looks like. Um, in fact, this is what allows you to take on the rhinoceros beetle and wrestle it. Um, <laughs> And I have been issuing challenges to various kind of Hemingway-esque characters, um, literary giants and swaggering museum directors and arrogant architects to come and wrestle the rhinoceros beetle. Um, and I know you want to see that, so let me um, show you what that looks like. Um, but before I show you, I want to have a show of hands. Who's, who's willing to take them on? Who's willing to wrestle a rhinoceros beetle? Where did I put it here? Okay. Okay. So this is my, actually my new fundraising technique. Um, I'm taking bets on um, who will win, the rhinoceros beetle or the human combatant. Um, I invite people to, um, to wrestle, um, uh, not only with the rhinoceros beetle, but other uh, particular issues. Um, uh, their, um, their incentives are quite straightforward. There's a female beetle around, and if they win, they, um, uh, I can show you some beetle pornography later, but um, <laughs> the um, uh, other ways, if the people win, uh, well, it depends on the odds and the betting. So. Um, um, it's a betting circle that I've raised. And in fact, additionally, I've um, started a scholarship for, um, uh, for a new varsity sport in rhinoceros beetle wrestling so that um, um, I'm offering rhinoceros beetle uh, champions a scholarship to my new socio-ecological systems design master's degree. Um, so if, uh, if you're particularly good at this sport, can you imagine... Um, if you had those, those green fields, those sports fields, and in one corner you had to have the special equipment and, you know, habitat for rhinoceros beetles so that they're happy enough with some, you know, interesting, juicy 
biodiverse soil. Um, and they got out and they kind of gradually tore up those toxic turf football fields and took over. Just imagine <laughs> if we could change sports or these kind of formalized uh, rituals of masculinity to to reimagine how we might engage with the natural systems on which we depend. And with that, I'll finish by saying that this idea, this this um, this cons this lie that we've been telling ourselves for the last 400 years. Uh, with the Enlightenment project, that kind of information or that knowing leads to action is really failing us now, right? This idea that we can, um, just by raising awareness or by disseminating information, create social change or radically reimagine our relationship to natural systems is not working. What we have, however, and Zizek points to this, is that the idea that our, our ideologies linger longer in our actions than in our knowing and in the time where, we, where we've got our hands on interactive technologies, where we can redesign interaction, what we interact with, who we interact with, and in fact change it to restructuring participation, that is aggregating the individual actions into participatory effect, into collective action, we might get somewhere towards changing our relationship to natural systems. Thank you. So we have time for questions. I'm sure there are some. Who wants to ask a question? They're all fleeing. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I went on a little long. I was, uh, no, that's OK. OK, go. Hey, um, you mentioned that uh, the grid you built in the East River for uh, fish Fish visualization um, sort of helps monitor chelating agents or something like that, which in my mind means like agents that trap heavy metals or something. Is that something inside of the fish that you're monitoring or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, wait, the, the, well, the typical approach, I think, um, in environmental monitoring is that you would, you would monitor the pH, the dissolved oxygen, the heavy metal levels in the river, right? Um, uh, the approach that I'm using is more like targeted drug delivery, right? Where the fact that there are fish there, right, is a novel spectacle. It's an interesting spectacle. The fact that people, most people don't know that there is a, a vivid population of um, a community structure of, of fish in the East River, right? That's, um, so we demonstrate that, but then of course that invites interaction, like, uh, that idea that, you know, every sign, or those tapping on the glass that, you know, do not feed the animals, they're only as ubiquitous as the desire to interact, right, the desire to do so, right? So it's that, how do you script that interaction so it's productive? You display that they're there, and then you re-script that interaction so it could be productive. And so, yes, the shilating agent is embedded in the food. I, um, I can show you some images of the, of the fish food that... Um, because of the trophic amplification, right, the, it's actually a much more effective way um, of targeting, you know, every trophic layer concentrates the mercury and heavy metals. So the, that's why we actually, uh, the top of the trophic layers, we have um, very high levels of uh, uh, mercury and PCBs in our own body burden. Um, and so by feeding it to the fish and shielding the fish, we're in fact um, removing the heavy metals from them and inserting or interjecting our, uh, or changing the route through which we ourselves ingest mercury and heavy metals through the fish, right? So by looking after the fish health, we're looking after our health. So this whole project that you'll recognize is, is actually by re, by understanding that our health depends on um, non-human health is um, is a, actually it's much more fun to treat um, to feed fish than it is to shilate mercury out of kids in you know in in 
the hospital. It's, it's much more, it's a spectacle, it's enjoyable, it's playful, and, um, and yet it's productive, right? So that's, that's the intersection. And I've definitely seen people fishing in the East River under the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> Sorry? They, I, they will be used for fishing? Or I've, I've definitely seen people fishing yes, in the East River. Yes, exactly. It's illegal to do so, um, uh, interestingly. So but yes, there are fish there. <laughs> and people even eat them. <laughs> yes. Uh, that one thing that would be so great is to just really think about how you can cultivate these sort of hybrid systems, you know, ecological animal-based systems with human systems, you know? How, what are the ways in which these kinds of projects can be, like, I don't want to sound terrible, but incentivized or, or really, cons really built into the kinds of um, cultural and social patterns that people find attractive? that people find palatable, right. and how do we interrogate those kinds of existing discourses that are actually, that connect what we find attractive to actually what's very deleterious to our health, to shift it around these various types of interfaces. I think that's such a big challenge for your interventions to actually have this kind of resonant social change. Um, right, I mean, so, yeah. and maybe that's not very recognizable, but I'll, I'll take the opportunity to clarify the kind of institutional approach which um, you know, very much the ooze is a counterpart to zoos, right, where we incarcerate animals and, and isolate them where we don't get to see how animals share territorial resources or manage their own populations or the complex social dynamics that are a functioning ecosystem. We don't see that in zoos. Yet uh, zoos and um, aquariums attract more people than all, all professional sports combined, right? So there are, there are a legacy institution that is, um, that has some social force, which is why in the, why the kind of this conceptual art tradition of institutional critique, these projects are aggregated into not just beetle wrestling for its own sake, which is, I guarantee you, lots of fun, um, but it aggregates into a kind of institutional uh, a recognizable institution and that the Bronx Zoos having just launched with the, I should actually also say, um, having just launched the Bronx Zoos um, officially around the Bronx River Arts Center, um, there's a number of um, artist residencies that are available um, uh, that I'm hoping a few people here will uh, take on to reimagine and design other uh, ways to interact um, with non-humans, um, and the, actually Rachel Mayeri is the first artist in residence in the Bronx Zoo's project, as you might know her work. There are many artists who have turned towards animals as a, um, and redesigning, rethinking, reimagining our relationship to animals that I think, um, you know, I'm trying to aggregate that into a kind of recognizable, recognizable institutional form that is uh, legible to a non-conceptual art, non-digital digital media audience. And the same way with the Environmental Health Clinic um, as an institutional form, each of the uh, projects, and there's many others, many that have been co-developed with um, inpatients and that inpatients have de been developing themselves and this whole genre of lifestyle experiments, which if you go onto the, onto the, social, onto the social networking site, the Ning site, um, where all the inpatient records are, you'll see there's many diverse um, projects that people are doing as kind of experiments to explore how they could change. But in terms of the institutional hack, kind of um, the Environmental Health Clinic has opened up two more. Um, there's a, uh, a wonderful design firm called Bread and Butter who have opened up an environmental health clinic in Lausanne, Switzerland. Um, and there's another environmental health clinic in in, um, in Reykjavik um, that's opening on May 15th. Um, there's one planned for Bristol. Um, so it's an institutional form. And in fact, the clinic form is probably the most successful form of the tw institutional form of the 20th century in that um, you know, therapeutic groups and self-help groups. Is, you know, it's it's what professionalized medicine. It's a it's a kind of a pattern that has an institutional uh, durability that uh, is duplicatable and 
and I think changes how designers, experimental designers, particularly, and you know, and conceptual artists, new media artists, people who are working with new technologies, precisely because that's a front of social change, precisely because that's where change happens. Um, I know with many people, of course, our careers get challenged, and uh, because you know we have to w do the work the clients, in the case of designers, pay for, right? Um, so uh, the bread and butter designers who have opened up an environmental health clinic and are doing some really tremendous work have changed who their clients are, right? They're now their clients are now their local community groups that they're working for, right? Um, and part of the hack is changing who constitutes a client. The other part of the hack is really about an institutional hack of, of what constitutes health. And so for many of the US-based inpatients, I've asked them to submit their costs involved in doing their lifestyle experiments to their HMOs, right? Because you can get reimbursed for, um, for ergonomic keyboards and, uh, you know, uh, ionizers, you can um, get reimbursed for ripping up asphalt in your, <laughs> your or, or the effort to do that, uh, which has brought me into a lot of uh, um, uh, conflict. Um, uh, it's a criminal act to file a false medical claim, apparently. I, so the legal counsel of NYU have told me, and um, the medical school has told me that I. Um, can't use the word clinic and I can't use the word health um, because um, I will, uh, I risk the, uh, I risk, um, what is it, um, they're concerned that I will mislead people who are really depressed um, who will come to the environmental health clinic instead of um, seeking SSRIs um, and I'm all for that. <laughs> They're concerned about that. But so this idea that you know using familiar institutional forms is actually an exploration in trying to experiment with how we can change. You know, certainly my own practice is you know to whom I'm accountable to and to to what um, you know and working co-producing projects with um, inpatients with whom I have an intimate relationship. Um, and an ongoing relationship is much more satisfying than having a work collected by a museum or uh, by a collector, right? So, so you know, all of us, our agency is limited, but by being able to understand kind of the interactions within the institutional context, I think we have the capacity to uh, network them into something uh, more like, yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. What exactly would be the extension of this? I mean, obviously, this is very proactive. Um, I like the way that you've equated it to like the allopathic medical system, where you basically treat disease, but they don't really do anything about creating health or anything like that. Um, and and I just wonder what what is the political arm? How do you make change, or what is what is your plan for making change outside of your front door? I mean, obviously, you can go outside and take care of your local area, but in order to facilitate like a change that's going to actually affect the globe we need to change the mindset of the politicos and the people that actually are controlling it. I mean, like, for instance, the AMA or whatever, trying to fight against a lobbying force that has so much revenue and political power. Right. Do, do you have, like, a, a, a future for that or a long-term sort of goal or plan? You know, it's actually, it's, it's a reaction. I mean, it's a very good point. It's, you know, that, that environmental issues, of course, can't be done by, can't be addressed by individuals that there is legislative policy stuff that has to happen. But I would argue that there's been far too much focus on policy. And, and you know, I have a good ally in this, John Dewey, right? He, um, his claim is that participatory democracy needs experiments, needs skeptical citizens who do their own experiments and who can develop um, 
um, who can develop a kind of a, almost a not a science as you would um, understand um, science done by professional scientists who are doing things for peer-reviewed journals and for their communities of expertise, but for their own, does this work? Does this work for me? Does this work here? Does this work, you know, can I improve local air quality here? Because once you can do that, then you've got something to talk to politicians about. And I have very little faith that contemporary legislators or policy designers know what the hell to do, right? And they don't have an experimental method. They can't figure it out. And even if they did have the perfect policy, you know, it has to be passed. Um, and would it continue to work even if it was passed without being compromised? Um, and it, would it continue to work uh, in the way it was expected? You know, policy changes very slowly and there's no kind of experimental um, way to kind of tune. Oh, that didn't work. Let's change, just try something else, right? So, so it's actually through these locally optimized but highly empirical uh, projects that I think we can raise the standards of evidence that are required to really engage, uh, you know, a radical rethink of the, you know, something like how we structure our envir uh, energy systems, right? That energy systems can be, can be locally, uh, locally off-grid production, local production of energy, right? There's no policy person who can imagine that. But if you get a gang of people who have their own solar awnings and various devices and are quite happily figured out how to, you know, charge their laptops and cell phones and have figured out how to work, how to live, then you've got a chance of actually aggregating a kind of feasible working policy initiative that builds on what people are already doing. So I think it's not a policy first project. I think we all have to figure out what works, what to do. Cap and trade has gotten us nowhere so far, and that's the best um, that's the, the best we've got. Um, and it's not the, the policy realm, the legislative realm is not the realm of, of experimentation. The realm of experimentation is where we have agency. So it's, it's really a st strategy to reinvest, to give permission to actually seize the authority to do these experiments that I'm trying to instrument that would could lead to intelligent policy design and decisions. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just finish off with one thing, because that's actually, I was going to do this, but I didn't have time. Um, this, <laughs> one, of the, one of the issues is, you know, who gets to make decisions about transportation alternatives, right? Who gets to, we're going to wait for the FAA to, to do something. Um, uh, are we going to, you know, is it, is it, you know, the Obama administration who's going to figure out what works for urban mobility? Or um, this, this is actually one of the devices that um, we're doing flight training with in Iceland. Because Iceland, with this new class of, of um, light aircraft, the sports pilot license, um, the very idea that we could radically reimagine urban mobility so that you didn't have to build extensive road um, infrastructure and that you didn't have to fill the wetlands um, or cheap swamps to make airports is beyond what most people think, right? And it's not until you can fly, and you know how everyone does that outside the window, mm. right? And explores the drag and the wing shape informally. That's what this is for. This is actually for, seriously, for flight training that you can get a, uh, a pilot's license. Um, from your flight training by using this outside a car window 
um, a flight of the imagination, if you will, of reimagining what it's like, um, and that you can fly, because that visceral experience of flying that gives you confidence that you could fly if you can drive a car. This idea that um, you know the personalised air transportation could be viable is something very hard for many of us to imagine that most of us don't really think we have the authority or the expertise to do that. But when you know how to fly one of these, you're much more confident that um, you know, you've got a pilot's license. So I think these uh, intimate experiences really change what we know and what we can imagine. I, I love how you take very complex, provocative social issues and make it fun, and at the same time present the complexity for people to walk away with. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Actually, no, you might have uh, one about me, but it's Ethan in Hebrew. So a lot of ah. Israelis have the name Eitan, I'm half Israeli. Uh-huh. There you uh, go. So yeah, I uh, tremendously enjoyed your talk. Thank you. And uh, I was wondering, uh, I was wondering